<laughs> okay, folks, uh, good to see so many of you. Very warm welcome. Uh, the numbers have somewhat taken us by surprise, but there you are. Um, as I survey the scene, I see a um, number of folks who could be up here and maybe ought to be up here teaching rather than sitting there relaxing, Some a number of retired ministers, but um, uh, there you are. Um, we're going to begin today um, looking at creation, or a little bit uh, about uh, what creation, what the, the Bible has to say about creation. Uh, so we're going to start by uh, reading from Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> Before we do that, let me just commit the time together to, to God in prayer. Father of Jesus and our Father, we bless you that we have come to know you also as the maker of the heavens and the earth. And we ask that you would draw close to us and enable us to come close to you at this time. We thank you for the revelation that you have given to us of yourself in the scriptures and above all in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that in him and through him and by your spirit you have enabled us to come to know you and we want to grow in our knowledge of you and deepen our fellowship with you through the Lord Jesus Christ. So bless us in our time together today and uh, over uh, the course of these coming weeks, the occasions when we're able to come and to meet. We ask that you would, by your Spirit, open up our minds and hearts to see lots of things old in your Word, things that we just need to be reminded of again and again, and perhaps also occasionally new things, new insights, new glimpses that we get of what you have been at about from the very beginning and indeed from before the beginning, from all eternity and will be about in your faithfulness uh, to the Omega point which will always be a new beginning uh, in the new creation. So bless us, uh, open us up to all that you have for us through your word and spirit and all we ask is in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. Amen. <coughs> okay, Genesis chapter 1. Uh, next week, I hope to speak specifically about what um, the opening chapters of Genesis have to say about humanity uh, before going on to the fall. Um, <coughs> So some of that comes in Genesis chapter 1, uh, as you know. But let's read from the beginning of Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. <coughs> and there was evening, and there was morning, the first day, or day one. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening. And there was morning. The second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. 
God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. Kind of throwaway phrase, isn't it? He also made the stars. God set them <clears throat> in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living and moving thing with which the water teems, according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. <coughs> God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. <coughs> and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures According to their kinds, livestock creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. God made the animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures <coughs> that move along the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds of the air, and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And blessed, and God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. I'm going to leave it there. May God bless to us uh, that reading from, from his word. Uh, if you've ever tried to preach, uh, those of you who are preachers, tried to preach a, a series uh, from Genesis, uh, you probably spent... Quite a number of sermons, or you could have easily spent quite a number of sermons in, uh, in Genesis chapter 1. There's a lot that we could say, that we could touch on from this passage. Um, I'm simply going to restrict myself to, to uh, what I think are some of the, the main elements of, of teaching here. I've given you a kind of breakdown of the, uh, where I'm going. Um, 
Hopefully that will help you to stay reasonably well on track and uh, if you ever have a chance of uh, going over the notes again, it um, gives you an opportunity of searching some of the scriptures and some of the verses and so on uh, that we're going to look at. I want to start at the, with the very first verse, uh, which I've uh, called the absolute beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Hebrew, it was originally written in Hebrew, of course, there's seven words there. And a sign of something of the completeness and the perfection of uh, what uh, God is always about. Uh, but just uh, three main things to notice from uh, verse 1, from the absolute uh, beginning. Genesis doesn't take us back beyond the beginning at this point. It doesn't take us back before uh, the beginning. Other parts of scripture do that. <coughs> Not just the New Testament, but uh, even in the Old Testament. Uh, Proverbs 8, for example, in verse 23, wisdom says, I was appointed from eternity, from the beginning, before the world began. So there in the Old Testament, uh, um, a reference to, to wisdom in existence before the world Began. We know that, of course, from the uh, fuller light of the New Testament to be a reference to Jesus, who is the wisdom of God, with the Father in wonderful fellowship before the world began. We come to the, the teaching of Jesus in John chapter 17 and verse 5, or the, uh, the, the great high priestly prayer of Jesus there. He, he speaks to his Father, in, or he speaks about the glory he had with the Father, uh, before the world was. And later on in that wonderful chapter, verse 24, uh, he speaks of the, the love that the Father had for him uh, before uh, the world, before the creation of the world. So other places of Scripture uh, take us back, as it were, before there was a beginning, before there was any creation before there was anything other than God. But Genesis 1 doesn't do that. The chapter starts with the absolute beginning. That is the absolute beginning of everything other than God. And that includes time, it includes space, it includes matter. And one of the things we learn from this is that matter is not eternal. Uh, it had a definite beginning in the beginning when God created all things. And that's, uh, interestingly, it, it's one of the many points of contrast that we find between what uh, the record of creation in Genesis and the stories or the myths that we have from other ancient Near Eastern nations like Babylon and Egypt and so on. Uh, there's... there's uh, there are some points of contact between Genesis and these other stories, uh, but mostly we learn that there, is, that there are great contrasts, and this is one of the, the great contrasts. In all these other stories, uh, matter seems to have always been there. But for Genesis, um, matter had a beginning. Uh, the second thing I want to point out from that opening verse is that... Um, God is identified there as the creator of the heavens and the earth. And that's, a, uh, that's an expression that just means uh, everything. I think it's the Good News Bible that translates it universe. That's a good translation. God, in the beginning, God created everything. Uh, it takes the two extremes, as it were, um, heavens and earth, and everything in between is included, as it were. God is the creator of uh, the complete universe. So there's nothing that God has not created. And one implication of that is that everything belongs to him. He made it, so it's his. He made it, so uh, he is sovereign over it all. Uh, he is Lord of all. The psalmist in Psalm 24 uh, knew a little of that. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Why? For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. God has created it, so it's his. Not ours, but 
at his. Another implication is that uh, everything owes its existence to God, and everyone owes their existence to God. Every one of us is dependent upon God. Every human being that has ever existed, whether they acknowledge God or not, depend on God. Atheists, agnostics, whatever. Paul uh, reminds us of that in Acts 17. For in him, and he's talking about all human beings, we live and move and have our being. The third thing I want to highlight from that opening verse is um, uh, the, the, the Hebrew verb that lies behind uh, the word created in English. Uh, it's the word bara. It's a word that uh, in every one of its 48 occurrences in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, is used only of God, always of God, the God of Israel. Uh, as the subject. The God of Israel is always the subject of that verb. The Bible speaks a lot about pagan gods and idols, but uh, this word is never applied to their activities. Pagan gods are never said to create. Idols are never said to create. Even human beings are never, uh, this, are never the subjects of this particular verb, are never uh, said to create in the way that God creates. Only the God of Israel creates. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. So creation, as we are talking about it here in Genesis chapter 1, is exclusively an activity of the one only living true God who became in time the, the covenant God of Israel and the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the God and Father of all who believe in him through Jesus. So what is being described here is, as one commentator has put it, a creative activity without analogy. There is nothing to compare it with. Uh, this is absolutely unique. Only God creates. He is uh, the creator. anyone have any comments or questions on any any of that uh, be free to, to chip in uh, from your vast experience and uh, all of that at any point perhaps when you begin to warm up you um, <laughs> you'll chip in a wee bit more okay on to verse 2 now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Uh, what's described here in verse 2 is uh, what I want to call earth's early condition. Earth's early condition. Uh, and I think it's two things I want us to, to note in particular uh, from this version. And, and the first of these is just the centrality of the earth. The centrality of the earth. Verse 1 uh, provides us with an introduction to God's work of creation. I think it also functions as a, as a summary of the, the whole of the work of creation as we find it in Genesis chapter 1. Embracing everything in the heavens and the earth and the whole vast universe, material and spiritual and then from that wide panorama, if you like, the, the camera <coughs> focuses in very narrowly and very closely and very particularly on the earth. First word in Hebrew in uh, verse 2 is the earth. And that's very unusual in Hebrew. Hebrew sentences always start with a verb unless you want to emphasize something. And whatever comes first instead of the verb is what is the focus. So you've got this broad uh, panorama of the heavens and the earth, the whole universe, but the focus from, that mo from verse 2 onwards is actually uh, on the earth. And everything else in uh, Genesis chapter 1 is actually described from the point of view of someone standing on the face of the earth, from an earthly vantage point. So if you like, um, the whole of the rest of the universe, 
All the galaxies, all that we know of the, the stars and the planets, as they're described in Genesis chapter 1, they are just part of the environment in which the earth and its inhabitants uh, are to be considered. The earth is the center of the universe, theologically speaking. Now we know from uh, the discoveries of science that in terms of astronomy, we're just a small dot in a solar system that is itself just a small dot in one of the outer arms of the Milky Way, that is itself, in the wider scheme of things, just a small dot in the universe. So the Earth at one level is inconsequential. It's just a nothing, it's a nobody, a non-entity. But from the point of view of the revelation God has given us in the Scriptures, Theologically speaking, the earth is the center of the universe. It's the main stage of a theater in which God's plans and purposes for his creation are being worked out. <coughs> and that, I think, is a very humbling thought. Uh, certainly the psalmist in Psalm 8 thought so, even with his limited knowledge, more limited knowledge than we have of, of the universe. Psalm 8 verse 3, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, <coughs> the moon and stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of? The son of man that you care for him in all the vastness of this uh, universe. How much more then uh, we ought to have that sense of wonder as people who know far more than the psalmist ever knew in terms of science, of the vastness, the greatness of the, the universe, the galaxies that are out there. So the centrality of the earth. Uh, the second thing I want to notice is the role of the spirit in creation. Uh, in its early form, uh, the Earth's early, we might call it embryonic form, immediately after God's initial act of creation, uh, the, the Earth is described in verse 2 as being formless and empty. Or if you're A.V., without form and void. <coughs> formless and empty. And the, the picture is one of utter uh, shapelessness, emptiness, barrenness, lifelessness. But... In the midst of all that shapelessness and darkness and in that barren waste, there is the giver of life, uh, the living Spirit of God, the life-giving Spirit of God, <coughs> Hebrew Ruach Elohim, hovering over the waters. And the Hebrew word, uh, the Hebrew verb that's translated at hovering at this point, it's found in only... Um, uh, two other places in the Old Testament. I've got them marked down for you there, I think. Um, Jeremiah 23 and Deuteronomy chapter 32. Now, why do I, I give you these details? Uh, well, how do we know the meaning of a word? How do we know the meaning of a, of a word in a language that's not familiar to us? Uh, well, we look at all the instances of the word, uh, especially if it's a rare word, uh, to see what light these other places, these other instances can shed on what it must mean in this particular case. If you look up Jeremiah 23 verse 9, uh, not just now, but uh, when you get home, the, the verb there describes the trembling of the prophet's bones. And that suggests uh, to scholars that the basic idea that lies behind this word, this Hebrew word, is that of movement, of vibration. There's nothing static about uh, the Spirit of God. Uh, what this indicates, at least, is something of God's dynamic presence. Uh, the Spirit is not stationary or static. The, uh, the Spirit is, is moving. The Spirit is vibrant with life uh, and with life-giving potential. 
And then the only other occurrence apart from Jeremiah 23 is uh, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 11. And uh, these verses in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32 describe how the Lord cares for Israel as an eagle cares for its young. If you read in from verse 10 of Deuteronomy 32, uh, Moses there describes uh, the way the Lord met with Israel at, it, at the very beginning of its existence in a desert land. He found them. A bit like verse 2 of Genesis 1. Desert conditions, waste, uh, no life. Uh, in a desert land, he found them in a barren and howling waste. He shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. And on into verse 11, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young. That's the word, hovers over its young. That spreads its wings to catch them and carries them on its pinions. And I think that uh, very uh, vivid picture in Deuteronomy 32 gives us a clue as to how we're <coughs> to understand the activity of the Spirit of God here uh, in the second verse of Genesis. It's like a bird. He's like a bird hovering over his nest, uh, over its nest. The Spirit of God is hovering over um, the young earth, the embryonic earth. Sometimes scholars say that the picture that we have of God in Genesis chapter 1 is of a remote God. Um, but this is anything but the case. Think of the intimacy there uh, the Spirit has with the earth and this intimate concern that he has for the earth. <clears throat> Here's a reminder here at the very beginning of creation that our God is not remote from his creation or detached from his creation He's never been remote or detached from his creation. He's always been, as we see here, actively involved, intimately, closely engaged with his creation in a personal way, like a mother bird sitting on, uh, on, on her brood, on her, on her eggs, or hovering over her nest. So this spirit, this living spirit, this vibrating, uh, this spirit who vibrates with uh, life and energy, and life-giving power um, is the one who's going to bring this early embryonic earth from the place where it's formless and empty to the place where it's formed and full. As God wanted it to be. Perhaps we can think of the, the, the work of the Spirit here, the Spirit as uh, in some sense preparing the earth, preparing creation uh, to respond to the creative word of God. Just as the Spirit works in our lives, even before we ever come to know Jesus or come uh, to know God, the Spirit is going ahead of that work. And the, uh, the Spirit prepares us to respond to the, the recreating, saving word of God in our experience. Uh, just some closing comments on, on uh, verse 2. Uh, this verse is probably reflected in uh, a number of New Testament passages, um, most particularly in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, where the conception of Jesus is described. Remember how um, Mary asks the question, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel responds with a promise, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Power of the Most High will overshadow you. That's just like Genesis, this version, Genesis. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. <coughs> and so, in a similar kind of way, uh, the same Spirit comes to sinners like ourselves in our moral darkness, in our spiritual darkness. Uh, to begin the work of creation or recreation with us, the work of, of salvation. Charles Wesley, in one of his uh, great hymns, Come Holy, uh, Come Holy Ghost, um, he adapted the, the words of verses 2 and 3 here from Genesis 1. Uh, Span thy wings, celestial dove, brood o'er our nature's night. On our disordered spirits move, and let there now be light. 
and uh, you have you find the same kind of um, phenomenon. Um, <coughs> The Spirit of God overshadowing a place. If you've read much about revivals, um, spiritual revivals and awakenings, um, that's often a kind of picture that, that is, is, is described. Uh, it appears in, uh, certainly in a, in a spiritual song that I've heard and read about, uh, written in Gaelic, about uh, a revival that happened back in 1939 in um, a village. <coughs> in my native Lewis, a village called Gerivart. Uh, but I also remember um, uh, an auntie of mine who's now gone to be with the Lord for some years. Um, she was involved in about 1970. Uh, there was a very localized uh, uh, awakening, a, a spiritual revival in uh, the village of Grava in Lewis. And uh, she worked in another part of the island, but... Uh, Every day would be dying to. She was a teacher, so desperate to get to get back home in the evening, and she would say that um, uh, just a two or three miles out of this village, it was as if she passed through a curtain uh, into the presence of God. The spirit was just overshadowing, uh, just as the spirit overshadowed the whole of the earth uh, at that time. Okay, anything there that one wants to, <coughs> anyone wants to comment on? Are we warming up yet? <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing that is just troubling me. Not, it's not troubling me, but um, when you talk about the universe, um, lately it seems that the scientists are using a new term, multiverse. Um, and we're, we're doing this uh, God question series in our church just now and so just wonder what are we to make of the multiverse? Well, good question. Um, the multiverse is something for which there is absolutely zilch evidence uh, and I think to some extent it's probably um, the desperate concoction of somebody who knows that the earth did have a beginning um, and wants to explain that beginning without, without God. And statistically, the one way to attempt to do that is uh, to suggest that there were so many, there are so many million universes and billions of universes that in one of them, by chance, life is created or life can you say though that if, if God has limitless power, couldn't He create limitless number of the universes just as easily as He created one? Um, yeah, but if that's the case, then I think what I've said here just applies one step further f further back. Um, this is He's talking about the creation. He's talking about the creation. Everything I said from the perspective of Genesis chapter one, the earth is theologically the center of the universe so if you want me to reformulate that the earth is the center of the, the multi-universe or whatever mm -hmm. but it's uh, it's the center of creation however you define yeah. creation in the genesis one they didn't know that there were things uh, called galaxies so they speak about the stars covering the stars and everything you see in the night sky but some of these uh, are of course um, galaxies so so yeah, um. on a similar scientific vein, um, we hear a lot at the moment about Earth-like planets being found, continually more and more of those, and you know, it's always feasible that there may be life on those. I don't believe I've read anything that precludes that, but clearly from the interpretation of scripture, um, the Earth would still be some kind of central within that culture. Yeah, I think that's um, theologically, I mean, who knows whether there is life out there? Um, sometimes, you know, I, I wonder if there is. Um, but uh, um, yeah, the theologically, the uh, the Earth is is is, is the, the center of uh, uh, the center of uh, of the universe. I mean, we could 
talk lots about that, but one of the things that scientists do when they look at possible planets where their life is, there's only uh, certain limits within which there can be life. And one of the things that makes um, uh, Earth so amazing is what they call the Goldilocks effect and so on. That we, we are in the right place in relation to the sun. Uh, we're, we're in the right place, we're the right size, we've got the right amount of water, we've got the right, you know, is that luck? Or is there a designer behind it? Excuse um, me. So the only thing I can think about this, what you're saying, is that when men start looking out and saying, well, there might be something, another world out there, another um, earth, then what they're doing is that they're discounting this one. Mm. It's like they're saying, well, this one is done. Let's look for a new one. I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I think we, we, uh, we have been created in such a way that, that we want to explore. Uh, and, and sometimes I think, well, what's the new creation going to be like? Which one of these planets am I going to be? Um, you know, uh, who knows? Uh, you know, um, I mean, the, the universe is, is so so vast, and uh, we we have every reason to explore it. But we can explore it either believingly, or we can explore it uh, wanting to keep God out of it. And there's a big, big difference in how we go about that. Okay, let's uh, let's go on to the the week of creation. <coughs> Uh, from verse 3 onwards, uh, and again, there's so much here, I'm just going to highlight uh, some of what I think are, are the more significant themes from this um, section. And the first thing I want us to notice is the, the role of the Word of God in creation. We've already noted from the previous verse that uh, the importance of uh, the important role given to the Spirit of God in creation. Uh, the Spirit was present, caring for the earth from the very beginning. I think He was guarding the earth, sustaining the earth in its embryonic state. Uh, but I think also we're to think of the Spirit as the, um, the what we might call the dynamic agent by whom uh, all the commands that we now hear in the six days of creation, by whom all these commands are put into effect. Uh, he's the one who does the things that God asks uh, be done. He's the one who carries out God's purposes uh, spoken through his spoken word. Um, so I suggested that uh, it's by the, the active power of the Spirit of God uh, that the whole creation begins to be formed and shaped and beautified and then filled with a, a rich, uh, abundant variety of, of life forms. But if the Spirit had a central role to play in the work of creation, then so also does the divine word. And that's picked up again and again in the Old Testament as well without coming into the New Testament. Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry hosts, by the breath or by the spirit, the ruach of his mouth. And uh, here in Genesis 1, we see the importance of the word of God in creation. Ten times we have the phrase, and God said. Ten times. Ten words. Uh, that govern the whole of creation. Kind of parallel with the Ten Words and the Ten Commandments. If you have ever noticed closely in Exodus uh, chapter 20, um, uh, what we call the, the Ten Commandments, they're actually the Ten Words. Ten Words by which God rules humanity and so on. Um, so there are Ten Words by which uh, He sets creation in order as well. Um, and God said, appears once in each of days, one, two, four, and five, twice on day three, four times on day six, 
one of the many indicators that day six is important, but also a, another indicator that day three is, is also significant, particularly significant uh, in Genesis chapter one. So this phrase, and God said, is found immediately before every new significant advance that we have in the whole creative uh, process. Every aspect of creation happens at the word of God. God speaks something new into being that never was before. Um, and it seems to happen, uh, according to Genesis 1, it seems to happen without any effort. Another of the great differences between Genesis 1 and the creation myths that we have uh, from all the other uh, nations, Babylonian and so on, uh, is, is this whole thing. In all the creation myths, there are battles. There is no battle in Genesis chapter 1. There is no opposition in Genesis chapter 1. Everything happens. The word of God is creative and powerful and effective. Psalm 148 uh, in the opening four verses of that psalm, the, uh, the, the angels, the sun, the moon, the stars, the highest heavens, the waters above the sky, all of these are called on to praise the name of the Lord. And the reason is given in verse 5 of the psalm, for he commanded and they were created. Psalm 33 that we've already mentioned, uh, verse 9, for he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. The word of God brings into existence what it says. It accomplishes God's desire and purpose and will. And that whole concept, of course, is picked up later on in the Old Testament, uh, not least by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah uh, 55 and, and verse uh, 11. The, the Lord speaking through the prophet Isaiah, he says... My word that goes, that's the word of God, my word that goes forth from my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The word of God spoken by God achieves his purpose. The word of God spoken by the prophet of God or through the prophet of God achieves God's purpose. And the word of God spoken by you and me today. Um, will equally achieve God's purpose. And the, the creation is actually a testimony to that because it's here by the word of God. That should be, the creation itself in that sense should be a, an encouragement to preachers of the gospel and just to all of us uh, as we witness, <coughs> as we try, however stumblingly, to, to speak the word of God uh, to others. So the work of creation is a Trinitarian work. Uh, it's a, a work which involves the three persons of the, the Trinity, of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In terms of uh, God as Father, the, um, the Apostles' Creed, the ancient creeds have picked up the words from the Old Testament, from the book of Psalms in particular, uh, which describe God as the maker of heaven and earth. And the Apostles' Creed begins, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. But the Son is also involved in creation. Remember the beginning of John's Gospel, which is actually, the opening words of John's Gospel actually bring us back to Genesis chapter 1. They reflect in the beginning. In the beginning. But uh, John gives us more light than, than Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. That Word that he then goes on to tell us became incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was that Word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Through him, the word became flesh in Jesus Christ. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So the son is also uh, the creator and involved in the work of creation. But so also is the spirit. As we see in Genesis in verse 2 here. Psalm 33, verse 6 again. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made their starry host by the breath or the spirit, the ruach of his mouth. Or in Job 33, verse 4, Elihu says to Job at one point, the spirit of God has made me. The 
breath of the Almighty gives me life. So the role of uh, the Word of God in creation. Uh, the second thing I want um, to highlight from this section of the creation days is, is just the, the fact that creation is very ordered and structured. Um, and that's obvious from the recurring phrases. It's one of the great features of uh, Genesis chapter 1, <coughs> isn't it? Um, I've got them listed for you there. Uh, the record of each day beginning with the same phrase, and God said... And there's a commandment, the execution of the commandment, the description of the act, uh, what has often been called an approval formula. God saw that it was good. A further divine word, usually one of naming or blessing. And then finally, closing with a um, similar expression, there was evening and there was morning. The so-and-so day. Uh, so the... the that pattern um, shows us something of the structured orderliness of the universe and the rule of God. And it is, of course, that order that makes science possible. Um, but it's also important to notice that though there is this order and pattern and uh, recurring uh, number of phrases, there's also a variety within that order. On no two days uh, do you get a carbon copy, as it were, a yeah, photocopy of what's gone on the day before, uh, on no two days do each of the phrases appear in the same detail or the same order. So God, though he's a God of order, is not a God who is boringly repetitive. Uh, he provides limitless variety. And these uh, recurring phrases, they reflect, I think, the character of, of God himself. And Paul hints at this in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, verse 33, where he says, God is not a God of disorder. But interestingly, he, he goes on to say, but of peace. He doesn't go on to say, but of order. He goes on to say, but of peace. God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And that's because one aspect of peace, of course, is orderliness and structure and harmony. Uh, but peace, shalom, is much more than that. It's, it's the wholeness that comes with that. So the creation is at peace when all the parts of creation are ordered according to the will of the Father in harmony with the will of the Father when all is a perfect unity, reflecting God's unity and the oneness of his, of his law. And it's, just, it's not just the record of each day's activity that's, uh, uh, that's ordered and structured. Uh, the structure is evident in, in other ways as well. I've already, I've already hinted at the, the kind of parallel there is between day three and day six. Which, uh, days which receives uh, special attention. Uh, but there's a, there's a parallel between day one and day four, day two uh, and day five and as well as day three and day six. Yeah, we could say more of that, but uh, I'll just point you to the, the diagram there um, on your page, which, which highlights that. <laughs> day one is about light. Day four is about the light-producing bodies. Day two is about the creation of sky and the waters that are separated by the sky. Day five is about the creatures that fill the sky and the water. Day three is about the land, creation of the land, the dry land, the vegetation that begins to grow in the dry land. Day six is about the creatures that fill the dry land, the animals and humans who are sustained by the vegetation that grows on the land. So there, there is a, a structure there. Um, Third thing uh, I want us to, to notice about uh, the, the six days of creation, or seven, the seventh day as well. There's a progression in the work of, of creation. Um, a steady progression. God takes the work of creation forward, stage by stage, step by step, towards its climax, which is the creation of uh, hum, human beings on the sixth day. 
Uh, but that's not its end, that's not its goal. Its consummation comes on the Sabbath day, uh, on the seventh day, the, the, the Sabbath of rest, the opening verses of chapter 2. And these uh, various activities of the six days of creation, I think, can be best understood as the, uh, what we might call the positive counterpart of the phrase that we have in <coughs> verse 2, formless and empty. What is God doing? Well, in days 1 to 3, he is bringing form where there was formlessness. And on days 4 to 6, <coughs> he's filling up each section of creation with uh, items or forms forms of life in particular uh, and that's um, again I've got a, a, a <coughs> diagram in the, in the handout which which highlights that so you start off with a formless world and then into that form comes light and with light comes color uh, so you've got light and day and all uh, the colours that open up with that. Then day two, uh, you've got uh, the upper waters uh, and the lower waters. Day three, the land. Uh, and that separation of the land causes the seas and the lakes. So the form is coming in each of these days. And then the second aspect is uh, the filling of each of these sections of creation. So what was formless and empty at the beginning of the week, by the end of the week, is formed and filled. And that's, uh, that's a pattern that we see in various places in the scripture. God often works according to that pattern of uh, progression towards completion. Uh, that's what he does with us. Um, we are all of us as Christians. We are, God has begun uh, the good work in us. He's not yet completed the good work in us. But he's progressing. Uh, we're all works in progress. Uh, all works in progress. And Paul, um, Paul I think actually uses the uh, the wording of Genesis chapter 1 and the beginning of Genesis chapter 2 uh, in a verse in Philippians, Philippians 1, 6, which uh, many of us will have learned off by heart. He who began a good work in you. The good work is reflecting the language of Genesis chapter 1. God saw that his work was good. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Uh, the word completion uh, repeats uh, the words that we have in Genesis 2 verse 1, uh, which highlights the, the completion of the work of creation. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. The Lord's day. Day of the Lord, the ultimate day of the Lord. So we can be equally confident that what God has begun in us, he will complete. He doesn't abort his initiatives. I think it's Peter in the New Testament who speaks about the faithful creator. And that means that he's faithful to creation. And he's faithful to his new creation, those who makes new creatures in Christ Jesus. Uh, he's faithful to the whole of creation. He, will, he doesn't abort his initiatives. <coughs> And uh, then a word about uh, the goodness of creation. At the end of each creative act, uh, you've got this uh, approval formula. Uh, God, like verse 4, for example, God saw that the light was good. What does the word good mean? Well, how is it used elsewhere in the book of Genesis? Uh, throughout the book of Genesis, um, the Hebrew word for, for good is most frequently um, used to draw attention to the quality of something. Uh, so in chapter 2 and verse 12, it describes good gold, the good gold uh, in paradise. 
It's also used in the sense of something that is fit for purpose. So chapter 2 and verse 9, the Garden of Eden, uh, the trees in the Garden of Eden are described as good for food. It's just perfect for giving us our provisions, for feeding us. It's good for food. The trees were good for food, fit for that purpose. When, everything, when anything functions exactly as God planned it, then it's good. It fits God's will, it fits God's purpose, it fits God's plan. But the Hebrew word uh, tov, the Hebrew word that's often translated good, it also can be translated as beautiful. Uh, in Genesis, the women are often described using this word. Um, chapter 6 and verse 2, but other, other chapters as well. Um, they are good. They are in the sense that they are beautiful. The land is described as good in the sense that it's pleasant. You get over a uh, wonderful um, creation and it's pleasant. It's very attractive. It stirs the soul. Just on a handful of occasions, the Hebrew word uh, here has, has a moral element to it. Uh, the most clearly there in uh, next chapter, chapter 2, verse 17. Uh, and there may be an element of that in, in the description of the universe here as being, as being very good, but uh, most of all it, it, it highlights the quality of what God has done and the appropriateness of every aspect of creation. Every bit of it is just doing what it's meant to do, fit for purpose. And it's also beautiful. <coughs> And at the end of the sixth day, verse 20, uh, 31, we read that God saw that it was very, do, very good. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The final work is perfect. What was formless and empty, a waste desert to begin with, has become perfection through the work of God. And what we have there in verse 31, I think, is as we have to some extent... Uh, at the end of each significant part of creation, as you go through Genesis chapter 1, you, you have God, the great artist, and he's just he's done the next bit of his canvas, and he stands back, and he admires his work, and he says to himself, yeah, that's great. You get something of the, the sense of satisfaction and delight that God has. Or, or God, the great gardener, and he's the one who plants the garden in uh, Genesis 1, verse 12. More of that in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, but he stands back. You ever done that with your own garden? You stand back when you've had a day hard at work in the garden and you've been arranging everything and ordering everything. And, and it's, yeah, a sense of satisfaction of, of uh, uh, a work well done. Well, you do that because you're in the image of the God who did that at the very beginning. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, we get a hint of the sheer delight as God stands back and he looks at this great uh, garden of creation that he's created and he says, this is just wonderful. And that's why we who are made in the image of God sometimes uh, will stand uh, before a scene in creation and uh, we're speechless. This is just wonderful. Very good seems inadequate in a, in, a, in a way but uh, um, I think that's the kind of, of, of idea and in all of this I think it's clear that um, creation itself bears witness to the greatness of God and the goodness of God and the glory of God and certainly um, the psalmist in Psalm 19 he talks about that the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Paul picks up the same idea in Romans 1 verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been seen clearly, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. So we look at the creation See the power of the sea, and that reminds us of the, the almighty power of God, uh, and so on. We see the invisible God in that, in those kinds of things. As someone has said, 
um, in creation all around us, we face God every day. If we have the eyes to see it, of course. And that doctrine of the goodness of creation, I think, is one that the church uh, has often lost sight of. Not least the evangelical church. The physical realm, it's uh, a teaching we need to regain uh, and retain. Uh, the physical realm is not evil. It's good. It's very good. It's not at enmity with God. It's God's very good creation. God's gift to humanity. God's provision for us as human beings. It's to be received joyfully. It's to be experienced fully. Read Psalm 104 or Psalm 148 afterwards and many other verses in Scripture. So we're, we're encouraged to enjoy God's creation to the full, to the maximum. Accept His good gifts. Enjoy the beauty of His creation. And marvel at its complexity. <clears throat> I think it's Francis of Assisi who once said, Let us leave sadness to the devil and his angels as for us. What can we be but rejoicing and glad? As Paul puts it in Philippians 4, verse 8, what, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Enjoy the very good creation that God has made. And the consummation of creation... <clears throat> is the Sabbath rest. Uh, I said already that uh, human, humanity, human beings made on the sixth day, uh, we might even say the, the afternoon of the sixth day, the, the climax and crown of God's creative activity, but the, uh, the first three verses of uh, Genesis 2 provide us with the, the conclusion uh, to the creation account. They mark what we might call the consummation <clears throat> towards which God has been bringing the whole universe from the beginning. And that is God's own Sabbath rest. So just a, a couple of things to, to pick up from that. I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but it means that human beings began from a position of rest. Human beings were created on the sixth day. The animals came first, so it was the afternoon of the sixth day, let's say. <coughs> Maybe even the late afternoon of the sixth day. It means that <coughs> man's first full day on the earth was what day? The seventh day. It was a day of rest. The Sabbath of God's rest. So before he began to, re uh, to work, uh, humanity rested. Human beings started from a position of rest. And that reminds us that uh, rest or God's rest is gift. It's not something that we strive for. It's not something that we can earn in any way. Uh, it's all gift. Gift from God. We find something similar in Israel's experience later in the, in the book of Exodus at the time of the Exodus. Uh, we know from the opening uh, chapters of the book of Exodus that the Israelites were given absolutely no rest by Pharaoh. The God of Egypt, or one of the gods of Egypt. Idols give us no rest. They were worked until they dropped. One of the things that the Exodus did for the people of Israel uh, was that it brought them the night they left Israel, they entered into their rest. At one level, they entered into their rest. There was no more oppression. They were at rest. From their burdensome oppression and toil. And that's actually reflected in the second form of the Ten Commandments that we have uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Um, the fourth commandment there... Uh, the Sabbath is linked with the, the deliverance of the people from enslavement in, in Egypt. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. 
On it you shall not do any work. Why not? Well, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. And the Lord brought you out of that. The Lord gave you rest from that. So what God's work of salvation is doing there is restoring the creation order. We start from rest when we start with God. And it's true in the Christian life as well. We all, as Christians, start from a position of rest. The moment that we respond to Jesus Christ, you remember his words, Matthew 11, you've often heard them preach, you know, some, those of you who are preachers will have preached them, the words of Jesus, come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, or weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's what happens when we come to Jesus. We start from a position of rest. We don't work for that rest. We can't earn that rest. We receive it as gift. The gift that Christ offers when we come to him. And then we begin to work for him. From a position of rest. So we begin from a position of rest. <clears throat> and we move towards our rest. Uh, and that, we find that with creation as well. Here. God completes the work of creation in six days. He rests on the seven. He ceases from his work. Uh, if you like, we can say that he keeps the Sabbath. Uh, the verb is Shabbat. So he Sabbaths. God Sabbaths on the seventh day. It's a pattern that we find elsewhere in Scripture. It's a pattern that Israel were encouraged to follow in the fourth commandment in Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Six days work, followed by a day of rest. Um, we're not to be slaves to work. It's one of the things about society nowadays. We just drive ourselves on. A society will drive us on to work and work and work and work. But we need to follow the, the order of God and rest as well. We move towards our Sabbath rest. We actually find this in the experience of Jesus in, in terms of his whole life. Uh, you remember where he meets in John chapter 4. He, he meets the woman of Samaria and he says to her at one point, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That's what I'm about. His work. The work of the Father. Here to finish his work. Then later in uh, chapter 17, uh, he says to the Father in prayer, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Where did he do that? Well, he's, he was talking about the cross. Chapter 19 and verse 30 of John, uh, the words of Jesus from the cross, it is finished. Completed work of Christ, the finished work of Christ, the work of salvation <coughs> on the cross. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What did Jesus do the next day? After he finished the work on the cross. Well, as far as his spirit was concerned, he enjoyed the rest of paradise with the thief on the cross. He dismissed his spirit to go with the Father. Today you will be with me in paradise. What about his body? Well, it was, he was crucified the day before the Sabbath. He was dead the day before the Sabbath. He was put in the tomb. It was the Sabbath. So he rested. His bruised and battered and dead body rested on that Sabbath, fulfilling the creation pattern in step with the whole will of God and all of that. Before he got up at the crack of dawn the next day to start the day of the resurrection, to start the next phase of his work. And it's something like that with ourselves. <clears throat> Revelation 14 <clears throat> Verse 13 tells us that at death we rest from our labors. As far as our souls are concerned, we enter immediately into the rest of Eden, paradise, the 
close a presence of God, presence of Jesus, just with the, the, the thief on the cross. Today you will be with me in paradise. And as far as our bodies are concerned, they rest in the graves until the morning of the resurrection. When we will all arise ready for the work of the eternal Sabbath. Some final thoughts, uh, three final thoughts. First of all, how do we know these things? How can we be sure of these things? All these things we've said about creation this afternoon. Well, over the, uh, the centuries of time, there have been those who have sought to prove the Bible's teaching about creation uh, through one so-called proof or other, uh, not least um, the argument from design. Uh, and I've no doubt that there's a lot to be said for that argument. I think it's, it's probably one of the stronger so-called proofs for the existence of God. Um, basically, it's the evidence of order and design we see around us everywhere in creation suggests to us that there is a designer who designed that. But in the end of the day, we don't rely on those kinds of proofs. At the end of the day, as Christians, we know these things about creation um, not by the force of logic or philosophy or rational argument, but because of a revelation that has been given to us in Scripture and we simply believe. Hebrews 11, verse 3. How do we know these things? By faith. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. It's a matter of faith. Faith in the person of God and in the words of God whom we have already as Christians we've already encountered in the person of his son Jesus Christ and through our saving encounter with Jesus or perhaps better, through his saving encounter with us, uh, we've discovered that what the Bible says about Jesus and about salvation is absolutely <coughs> true. And so we trust that what it says about creation is equally true. So by faith we know these things. Secondly, it ought to lead us to, to worship. Uh, the only appropriate response to all of this um, <coughs> The teaching of Genesis 1 and other parts of the Bible uh, about creation is that we need to worship the Creator God. And human beings in particular made in the image of God, made with a capacity for fellowship with God, made with a capacity to, to express verbal worship, heartfelt, spirit-felt worship to God, the crown and climax of creation, uh, we ought to worship Him. Uh, Revelation Chapter 4, uh, John was privileged in one of the many um, privileges that he had, one of the many missions, uh, visions that he had. He, was, he had a glimpse into heaven in Revelation chapter 4. And he saw representatives of the covenant people of God, Old Testament and New Testament there. He saw representatives of the whole of creation worshipping the God who sits on the throne at the center of the, uh, of the heaven and of the vision. And these are the words that we read, uh, Revelation 4, verse 9. The living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and, uh, and God, to receive glory and honor and power. <coughs> Why? Because you created all things. Mm -hmm. By your will they were created and have their being. Or uh, as some of us sometimes sing, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works your hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. How do you respond to that? Then sings my soul. 
my savior. Interestingly, not my creator, but my savior. God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. And one final word. Uh, creation is where it starts and creation is where it ends. Eternally. And the last two chapters of uh, the book of Revelation show us that clearly, but the other parts of the <coughs> New Testament show us that as well. We don't end up eventually or forever at last in heaven. Or in a spiritual state in some disembodied form, we end up in a new creation. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that. The faithful creator is faithful to his creation. He brings the whole of creation to its planned conclusion, to its consummation. Consistent with everything that we find in Genesis 1, the beginning of Genesis 2. He brings all his people at last <clears throat> in resurrected bodies. To be part of a very real universe, a very real physical universe that is described in various places in the Bible as the new heavens and the new earth, or simply the new creation in which God himself comes down to dwell amongst men, amongst human beings, forever. Revelation 21 verse 3 on the new earth in the new creation so creation is very very important creation is forever because it's from the god who is forever any other any thing that you want to pick up there or comment on one level it's, it's a lot to cover in, in one day. Why does it seem um, when God said let us make man in our image and then we're going to talk to him and then later on see that um, God formed man I don't understand why it has in chapter 1, it says, uh, let us make man in our own adapter our likeness, and, and then it, um, so God it created man in his own image, and then in chapter 2, it says that the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils and planted the garden, and I'm just, I don't understand why, I'm sorry. No, no, uh, uh, perfectly, perfectly good question. Uh, the answer will come next week. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because next week is uh, creation of humanity, and it's two, two separate uh, uh, depictions, emphasizing different aspects of, uh, bringing out different aspects. Anyone else? Any? There's just a small point. I wonder if you could enlarge on evening and morning. We would normally say morning and evening. Yeah. Um, I, it follows. It, it follows. Um, yeah. I have to understand that, of course. Uh, the evening for a Jew starts at 6 o'clock, so it's when the sun goes down. So evening is darkness, darkness and light. Well, where does Genesis 1 begins with darkness? Uh, so morning is, comes when the light comes in verse 3. 
Um, and that's probably, I think, where, where, where the Jewish idea of the day comes from, that, that you start with, with evening and morning. It shows you how, how used we can be to things we think of a day as morning and evening. Um, where did we get that from? The Jews base it on the Bible, so they start in the evening to the morning. And that, I, I do wonder sometimes if that's uh, what lies behind the old, uh, in the highlands, they would, um, in, in the days of Sabbatarian strictness, real Sabbatarian strictness, uh, um, you wouldn't do any work past sundown on Saturday. Is that why? I don't know. Could well be. Okay, conscious that uh, folks have, uh, will have to leave. Let's let's just close in prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, the revelation that you have given to us in the scriptures concerning your creation. We thank you that uh, uh, that revelation reminds us that you have revealed yourself, certain aspects of your character in your creation. Uh, we have to confess, though, that uh, often. Um, as we look back in our own experience, it's only as we have had our eyes opened to our need of salvation and to Christ as our Savior uh, that we began to appreciate our creation and that we began to see something of your beauty and power and might and wonder and orderliness and peace and harmony uh, in what we see in creation. Thank you for that revelation. Thank you for the greater revelation that you have given to us through your word and through Jesus Christ uh, and that you bring us into life. You bring us to rest in yourself and you bring us at last to your eternal rest, to your eternal Sabbath in the new creation. Bless us then as we partake us safely to our homes in Jesus' name. If the, if the Sabbath started in the evening, did it end following the evening at six? Well, if you look closely, the seventh day doesn't have an evening and a morning. So why not? Is it an eternal Sabbath that's been spoken?